All right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to be trying something today. I'm going to see if this goes through. It looks like I might have this set up correctly. I'm hoping that this is going to work. I'm watching both uh, screens because I'm looking at doing kind of a simulcast where it streams on two different sides. So give me just a few moments. Hopefully this works. If you are seeing this, please do me a favor and let me know if you are seeing something on the uh, YouTube shorts side. If you're not coming through the YouTube shorts side, let me know and we'll make sure we're there. Hey, Kane Friday, what's going on? <clears throat> so Kane, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to let me know um, by putting a one in chat if you're watching this in vertical mode or a two in chat if you're watching this in horizontal mode. Um, let me know which one's going through. I've got two simultaneous streams set up. Hey, David Carlisle. No, that doesn't help me. One, <laughs> one for vertical, two for horizontal. Okay, horizontal, outstanding. We're gonna see if, okay, outstanding. Now I'm gonna try and see if we got it. So I want one of you guys, do me, do me a favor. In the chat, there is a link. Hey, Steve, looking for silver EMR. Good to see you. There is a link. It's pinned to the top. And in that link, there should be something that says, go to, you can see both. So you can see both of them are there. Okay, outstanding. Now, what I'm curious to see is if the chat changes. So Steve, looking for silver, outstanding. Okay, thank you so much, Steve, for doing that. All right, so I am doing something totally different. So what I'm trying to do right now is from a single location, I want to stream at both outstanding folks. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so what I want to do is I want to see if I can stream both in the vertical landscape and the horizontal landscape. Oh, this is awesome. I'm so glad this is really good because what I'm going to be doing, okay, so we got the chat. The chat is a little bit high. It's kind of into my mouth. I'm probably going to have to lower that down a little bit. So let me drop that chat down just a little. I'm going to have to mess with this stuff a little bit later, but I think we should be good to go. Let me set myself up a little bit higher. Ah, I'll mess with the formatting later. These are things that I need to look at and work through as I do this. But what I wanted to do is I want to give people options. If you want to be looking at this stream from a wide angle, then you've got this here. So you're able to do that. But if you're on your phone, and it's just too small to see it on that wide angle and you want to see it in vertical mode, you can go ahead and go over there. You can click on it. You can click on that link and you can come on over and check it in the horizontal mode. Now, the horizontal mode should be showing up in the YouTube uh, shorts feed. So I'm really hoping that we can pull two audiences together to talk about the topic that we're going to be talking about today, which is the dolly, the crash on the bridge. Now, a lot of people are like, why in the hell, Frosty, are you talking this, right? You're a coins collectible channel. Why are we talking the dolly? Well, if any of you have paid attention to me at all <laughs> in the over a year that I've been doing this, you guys know I love my ships. And this is just one of those things that I absolutely love. And I really want to kind of talk about some of the situations that are here. I want to talk a little bit about the history of what's going on and what are all of the items that come together in order for an event like this to occur. So before I get into this, I'm going to do what I always do. I'm going to say hi to my fellow compadres that are in chat. So Kane Friday, thank you for being in here. Appreciate you testing it out. Steve looking for silver. Thank you for being a channel member. I definitely appreciate you, bud. Thanks for all the call outs that you do for my channel. I really, really appreciate you. Um, thank you also for testing it, letting me know which side you're in. That's awesome. David Carlisle, moderator extraordinaire. Thank you so much for being in here. I appreciate you. Scratch and go crazy. I hope you're doing well. Good morning, Jeff Davis. Again, thank you for being a channel member. I really, really appreciate this. EMR Coins, good to see you. Thank you for being in here. I appreciate you being a channel member as well. I already said Scratch. Malcolm, good to see you. Jesse Nuckenberg, how are you doing? Good to see you. I'm glad you're here in the chat. Oh, all right. Well, I think I'm caught up. Again, this is going to be a little bit different. I know you probably got different notifications, but if you're in the portrait mode and you want to see it in landscape, just go to the pinned comment and come over. Hey, HVAC Residential, what's going on? Begotten Solitude's in the house. Thank you, Begotten. I appreciate you being here. What's going on, EMR? 
Again, if you're on your computer, you want to see this widescreen, then go to the, if you're seeing it narrow, I know a lot of people don't like that. Go ahead and kick, click on it. Um, if you were on your phone and you want to see it in more of the, the, the stand up mode, the straight up and down mode, the vertical mode, then you can go to the, the chat. You can go over, click on that, and then it will take you to the other format. Um, ah, this is awesome. I'm so glad this is working. I was really concerned about the item to uh, happen. It looks like everything is going really well. So outstanding. Thank you for being in here. All right. So let's see. Who else do we have in here? It looks like we have. Yeah, it looks like. Hey, Jesse. Okay, good to see you. Ashes, what's going on, Ashes? You're in the vertical. Outstanding. Okay. So Ashes, as I've been telling people, if you want to go see it in the horizontal mode, you can go click on the link that's pinned at the top of chat and you can change that over. Um, I've got this set up today to where I'm going to be talking about uh, kind of the whole construct of how we got to where we got with a ship running into the bridge. There's been a couple of these. Hey, what's up, Strider? How you doing, bud? Bifrost is not here today. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, if you'll do me a favor, if you're the praying in type, um, Bifrost grandfather is pretty much on his way uh, to the greater place in the sky. And so uh, Bifrost probably won't be here this weekend. She is going to spend time um, with her grandfather. Um, again, it looks like he's going to be passing pretty soon. So if you were the praying type, please do prayers for her. She's having an extremely difficult time. Um, her grandfather has been a good man to her and has been really supportive of her hobbies and things of that nature. So just be, you know, offer those prayers up. And if you guys are in, turn off the advertising, please. It shouldn't be on. Is it on? Uh, let me see. Uh, hold on just a sec. I will do that. Give me a sec. Um, edit. Station. Do, 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 do. Okay, let me check this out real quick. I thought I had those turned off. Obviously, they did not. Um, manually and save. Okay, so they shouldn't show up unless it asks me whether or not I want to do this. So that should be good. Um, hopefully, that's better for you. Let me know if that doesn't change. Watching both at the same time. <laughs> um, are you watching one from your phone and watching one from your computer? If so, that's really cool. I got it on my TV. But okay, so there are individual settings that happen through your service provider that allow for those things to come through. And unfortunately, in some of those, um, I was working with a gentleman the other day trying to get those things turned off. And unfortunately, I was not able to do anything about it. Um, what I'm trying to do is trying to set it at the maximum level of 30 minutes with it basically asks me if I want to uh, show a view. Yeah, it obviously should be no. If it happens anyway, let me know. I'm going to continue to work with the settings. YouTube did change a couple of things and it makes it really hard for you not to show them if you have monetization on. Um, and so we'll kind of check with that. Hey, stacking with Kraken, appreciate you. Uh, thank you, HVAX, for letting me know. I'll see if I can't do this. Good morning, Dan McCumber. Hey, Miss Coin Crew, good to see you. Thank you. And again, please do me a favor and show mm -hmm. that out. Dual screens on PC, but only listen into one. Not quite synced for audio. Um, interesting. Okay. So does the screen show both the vertical format and the horizontal format at the same time? Or are you looking at two different screens? Um, let me know because I'm curious to see kind of which way you're looking at. Uh, there are going to be a little bit of delays on the uh, vertical side um, because I'm the way I'm screen uh, because of the way I'm streaming this. But we'll see. We'll continue to play with this, and we will see. Um, the streams. One of them should be coming through your shorts feed. The other one should be coming through your normal long form feed. Um, we'll see if that works. I'm not sure exactly how that works, but you should be able to click on that link and see that in the other one. If you're on your phone, it should be, it should fit to frame. Um, and if that's not happening, let me know. Again, this is the first time we're doing this. 
So we'll kind of check that out and see what's going on. Um, I definitely see more people in my normal long view format. I expected that the first time. Hopefully as time goes, we'll see more people in the vertical. Uh, but again, I've got to check with this. I'm actually, I should be looking this at my phone and see how it displays uh, to see if it shows up in the YouTube side. So let me check that real quick and see if it's even shown up. It may not work for me. Um, let's see. Oh, you know what? Yeah. Okay. So I see this in the, yeah, it works just fine. I'm going to turn that volume down and I'm going to show that there. Very cool. All right. So yeah, the the screens, dual screens on the PC only, but not listening. Oh yeah. Okay. There is going to be a little bit of delay. I've probably got about a three extra second delay between the wide format and the vertical. Now, Farm Dog, if you want to see the widescreen format in chat, and at the very top, there are some um there's a pin link, and you can click on that link and it'll take you to the wide format version so anyway good to see you hey thank you for coming in ashes i appreciate you being a channel member Dell m hey thank you for being in here i definitely appreciate you coming in i think i said hi to stack and if i didn't stack and crack in thank you so much for doing that farm dog appreciate you being in here thank you for everything that you do all right so what i'm going to do is i am going to go through and again if you're not a subscriber go ahead and click on that please support the channel um if you're if you're watching this and you're not able to put into chat, it's free to you, but it really helps me out. So please make sure you're smashing that subscription. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. I'm going to show you guys a little bit of something. We're gonna start talking about the general process of what happened with that bridge and the ship. Now I have a Navy round here and I'm not gonna tell anybody when I'm gonna be giving that away. I'm not gonna tell you um, kind of exactly what's gonna happen, but it's here. And I'm going to be giving that away. I also got a 90% AU uh, Franklin half. So stay tuned because I'll be giving those away. But in order to get that, you're going to have to be entering into chat, which means you're going to have to do the thumbs up and all that other stuff. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be switching screens and I'm going to go, bam. All right, there we go. So now we have what we call the Swiss cheese model. So the Swiss cheese model is something that we use in process improvement. And the Swiss cheese model basically works something like this. In order to really identify kind of where barriers and situations happen, there's going to be an alignment of things. And so you have different barriers across different platforms. You have different events, different things that occur um, through the history of an accident, okay? So as we're talking about the dolly running into the Francis Key Scott Bridge, there are some things that happened all the way along this path that just happened to align. So I'm gonna be talking about some of those. I'm gonna go over a couple different elements and kind of walk you through kind of what you would see in kind of just the overall history, the overall viewpoint of this particular item. What's going on, Jackalope? Good to see you. Hope you're doing well. Ringmaster Ray's in the house. Um, yep. Good to see you. What's up, Coin Junkie? Uh, again, if you are in the vertical side and you want to see this on the horizontal side, then you can go ahead and click on chat. If you're on the vertical side and you're on your phone and you want to, or excuse me, if you're on the horizontal side and you want to see this on your phone and you want to look at it in the vertical mode, just simply go click on that uh, link down in the chat that's pinned and click and you can change back and forth between modes. So this is totally up to you and which one you want to see. There will be a delay between the two of them. So if you're trying to watch them simultaneously like Ashes is doing, there's going to be a time delay and a voice delay between the two. So we'll play with that. We'll see what happens. All right. So we're going to talk Swiss cheese model. So in order for things to happen, in order for the outcome to be the incident, like what we had with the bridge being hit and the collapse and everything, there were some things that had to happen in order. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the history. So what you should be seeing on your screen is you should see the accident. And then down below, you're going to see six key elements that I'm going to kind of be talking about re regarding the situation. Now, we're going to be talking about history. Now, you guys know, again, what's Frostbite doing talking about a ship? Well, if you know me, you know I love my ships. And now, believe it or not, there are coins. There are coins that have container ships on them. There's one from 1973, Libya, I think it is. 
Uh, it's a world coin and it has a tanker on there. So there are coins that actually have these ships on them. I'm actually looking to try and find the 1973 Miss Coin Crew. You might be interested in that one as well because it's our birth year. 73 is the best year. And anyway, so they do have coins regarding tankers and things of that nature. So if you're wondering, this really isn't a stretch. I'm talking about coins. I'm talking about ships. Ships are the things that I really enjoy. So this is kind of one of those things. But in a short that I did uh, a while back, there were some things that were talked about controversies, right? Like, oh, there was a cyber hack on this ship and this is why the ship crashed in. Oh, this was done deliberately. No, it wasn't. And we're going to talk a little bit about why I say that. If you are a conspiracy theorist and you think that there's there's ways that you can hack that, we're going to talk about that today. We've got a whole wide variety. I'm going to show you a couple of things. I'm going to show you what I have as far as presentation. And then what we'll do is we'll kind of open it up and we'll be putting in um, 72. Ah, you're okay. <laughs> uh, HVAC's just a little bit older than me. Now I can pick on him. All right. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit about the history. So the first thing that we really have to kind of understand when we're looking at this event is how did we get the massive tankers, right? And so the way you look at the massive tankers is you have to really understand kind of the origin of the container, right? So the container is the thing that made shipping what it is today. And the first commercial container ship, the one that it basically was isolated. Hey, what's going on, Check Stacker? Thanks for being here, bud. I appreciate you. If you look at the first ship, you're going to see, if you look through history, you're going to see the first standalone ship was called Ideal X, and it came out in 1956. And a lot of people were like, that was the first one, but actually it wasn't. The one actually came way before that, and it came from converted T2 tankers that come out of World War II. But it wasn't the ship itself. The ship itself wasn't the thing that really kicked off the, the transcontinental shipping that it is today. What's really important to understand is that in the 1960s, only about 20% of the world's economic output or the GDP included transcontinental shipping, right? It, it wasn't a huge big, the, the GDP of this was only around 20% back in the 1960s. So while shipping was a big deal, it wasn't until about 2017 that we increased that to number almost a 50%. And now today we're probably closer to 75, 80, maybe even 85%. But in order to answer that question, why was it that in 2017, this major thing happened? Well, we have to understand a little bit about the containers. We have to a little bit understand about the ships. And we have to kind of understand the history of these. So I want to talk a little bit about the container itself. So there, there are a couple of things that happened. So in the 1950s, this gentleman was looking at ways to improve. Now, if you understand anything about old ships and talk about pirate ships and the storing of things like that, for my Navy brothers and sisters or my military members who ever spent time on a ship, you know that when you unloaded stores, in many, many cases, the way that you stack and move stuff was by the strength of your back. Good, strong arms, you picked it up, you moved it, and you stacked it, and you put it into place. And you would stack it in such a way that you would balance the yaw of the ship, right? The yaw is the thing that makes it go back and forth. And so in order for your ship to run straight, you needed to make sure that the loads were balanced. Now you can change ballast and things like that to kind of balance it out. But back in the day, they didn't really have that, especially in the old wooden ships. They needed to make sure that they balanced that ship. So everything they did as far as transport, whether it be silver, whether it be gold, whether it be treasure, whether it be food stores, um, the, the items, they call them stores, but they're actually like storage. Um, you, they all had to be done by hand. But it wasn't until the, develop, the development of these containers themselves that actually really changed the way that we see shipping internationally. And the person who did that um, was a name by the uh, gentleman by the name of Malcolm McLean. Now, Malcolm McLean was a forward thinking gentleman. And he was like, look, we have these situations. We have these items that are stacked. We have these items that are put away. They're put aside. However, there's really not, it's not really that safe for people. And so how do we keep 
loads from shifting, right? How do we keep things from shifting and causing a ship to become off balance? And so, yep, balls are another one. Um, cannonballs, that is. <laughs> um, and so you had to worry about how do you keep things from moving around? And cannonballs had these really cool little stacks that they would set stuff on and they had holes and then they were grooved down and then the cannonballs would set in and then they would set the cannonballs in each side. They would stack them like a pyramid. If you go golfing and you see those little pyramids, you'll see that they pour the golf balls in and they stack into a pyramid. Uh, it's the same basic premise. So there were unique ways of stacking. But Mr. McLean decided that there, there's got to be a safer way to do it. There were too many dangers that were involved in the relation to shipping. And so they wanted to do something like create the container. Now, the container was really important, but the container itself wasn't the thing that, the thing that kind of catalyzed this into what it is today. There were two events that happened. And one of them was something you're probably not really kind of pairing this to, and that was World War II. So at the end of World War II, we had these massive, massive oil tankers, and they were meant to supply um, oil and crude and gas all the way across the Atlantic to support the effort in Europe, right? We wanted to support the European effort. We had great big convoys. The ships needed to be supplied. Uh, we had the tenders that supplied the vessels with food and stores and ammunition and things like that, and they had to be fueled. And so we had these massive, massive tankers that would be utilized to feed the ships so that they can continue to move, right? Same thing with submarines and things of that nature. So we had these massive vessels that would go back through World War II, and they would kind of go through and do this um, back and forth. So you had captains that really understood the channels. You had really good lanes and people who really understood kind of the construct and the method of these shipping channels and these shipping lanes. So you had these pilots who were really good, uh, the, the captains that were really good with navigating um, transcontinental commerce. Well, cue the container, and now you had a pilot who not only understood the commerce, understood the travel lanes, but also had the ability to store stuff without it shipping. It became a safer way to transport. But the next item that really lit up things was this, and a lot of people are gonna go, how in the hell did Vietnam really change the way our shipping industries work? Vietnam actually is where they utilized the, the T2 container ships at their largest companion. Now, Malcolm McLean sold his container idea to none other than the United States military. And so the first people that really utilized this were the military. And so they already had the infrastructure set up. They knew they needed to support the war effort. And so they utilized these containers to transport ammunition and stores and goods from the United States over to the, the coast. And you can see in that map, the right-hand side of Vietnam is all ocean-based. It's all supported by that bay. And you can see all the way up to Hanoi. You've got all this shore area where they could drop and unload stores. They could connect a helo, lift that stuff off, drop it into the location that they needed to, and then get out of there as quick as they could. So these transports actually did a lot to support the war effort in Vietnam. Now, this was a key enabling factor in the development of what they call containerization. Now, containerization was the utilization of these containers throughout uh, the shipping. What's going on, Siren? Good to see you. Asan Hook, thank you for being in here. I appreciate it. Hi, Paula. Roxilla, anxious. Good to see you. I'm not really looking at chat a lot, and I'll kind of go back and forth. But Vietnam was the big thing that really kind of shifted this containerization in the Pacific. And it was because of the escalation of the Vietnam War that they utilized these things more and more and more. Now, many of the improvements were done because of the logistic things that were utilized by the military and understanding how that military prowess and how that military function worked. They were able to identify things like stacking strategies and how to align um, containers on the deck, not only for better transport, but for a little bit more safer transport as well. The next thing we're going to talk about is the Panama Canal. Now, if you guys don't know, the Panama Canal was created 
1914, and there were a number of different efforts. Now, I'm not going to go over the entire history of the Panama Canal, although the Panama Canal is an amazing story, and people like Paula who were engaged in the medical field know that there were a lot of great advancements that come from the development of the Panama Canal within regards to like the vaccination of yellow fever and things like that. Um, because the mosquitoes and, and a lot of people were dying of typhoid and, and yellow fever and all these different diseases. And so a lot of advancements came from the development. And there were there, the French had tried years and years before, but the U.S. finally got involved. And in 1914, the Panama Canal would be, the Panama Canal project would be engaged. But it wasn't the Panama Canal opening that was the catalyst that allowed us to get these larger and larger and larger container ships. What happened was in 1979, a team of engineers had started, whoops, sorry, a team of engineers had started to plan um, for the development because they had noticed, and if you look at the ship that's there, you'll see that it's really, really narrow inside that lock. And the problem was, is that there was a very specific breadth and a very specific length that you could have as far as a ship. Now I know the dirty minds out there are going like, oh yeah, he's talking about breadth of length. No, that's not where I'm going. But when you have this ship and you have a certain size that can go into this slot, here I go with the acronyms, um, you had a very limited run, or you have a very limited side of things. You, there's the very limited things that you could do as far as transport. So in 1979, they started the lock project and there were two major components. They wanted to increase the set of locks. So they wanted to do one both on the Pacific and the Atlantic side of things. Because for those of you who don't know what the Panama Canal is, it passes from the Pacific to the Atlantic or the Atlantic to the Pacific and allows you to not have to go around the Cape Horn, which is some of the worst seas. The the, the seas in the Cape Horn that down there at the bottom of Africa are abs or excuse me, South America are horrible. Um, they have the worst seas probably in the entire globe. And a lot of ships that try to circumnavigate that area end up sinking. And so they needed to stop doing that. It was very dangerous. So they created the Panama Canal. But what they wanted to do is they wanted to open this up so that you could have a wider displacement ship and you could have a deeper keel. So they needed to dredge it out, make it a little bit deeper and they needed to make it a little bit wider so that you have some of these larger and larger and larger ships that were allowed to go through this. Now, the ships, when they staged, get staged in a place called Guten, or Gatun Lake, a Gatun Lake, G-A-T-U-N. And so what they would do is they would bring ships in and they would see if they ran aground and then they would dredge and they would open these things up and extreme and expand that channel length. Now, why am I talking about all of this? Well, it's really important to understand that this was one of the primary reasons that the dolly was able to be created. Now, the dolly was a what they call a Neo Panamax. Now, a Neo Panamax container ship was something that was only available after Panama expanded. Before Panama expanded, these size ships were not able to go through that. And therefore, they only had to stay within their region. They could only stay Atlantic. They had only stay Pacific. And because a lot of that required navigation through the Panama Canal, the size of ship was limited. But now you have the Panama Canal that expanded. Now, so you have this larger, uh, uh, I just went blank. Uh, you have this larger area where the ship can go in. And when the lock, the lock, that's what I was thinking of. When the lock went through, 75 and pennies with the $5 super chat. Thank you, 75 and pennies. I appreciate you. Happy Easter to everybody. Thank you so much. What's going on, Papa York? Thank you for the super chat. I really, really appreciate it. Um, but it's because of the expansion of the Panama Canal that this was able to actually happen. Now, again, we talk about the Dolly and we talk about some of the things that happened. We're going to talk about some of the Swiss cheese items. Okay, so the first thing that happened in the Swiss cheese, going back to that Swiss cheese reference, is the ships being transport, transported from anchor to containers, right? The containers. That was the first element. Once the container is aligned, 
it aligned and was able to connect to T2, which is the ship, the container ships that were utilized in World War II. That's the first hole in the Swiss cheese. When we get to the next one, the next hole that aligned in the Swiss cheese was the Panama Canal. So now we have six layers of the Swiss cheese. They're all kind of whatever. But you finally have the third layer aligning up. The fourth layer is the creation of the Neo Panmax ships that, that were quite large. Now, the overall length of one of these is about 300 meters or 985 feet. Ironically, the ship that I served on was 985. It's USS Cushing. Go check it out. Pretty cool ship. It had a beam of 48.2 meters, which is about 158 feet. Uh, the molded depth, now the molded depth, if you can see this, you'll see that kind of highlighted area that is kind of, it's a shaded. You'll see kind of the molded look on that. You may not be able to see that very well on the vertical view, um, but that gives you kind of an idea when I talk about molded length and gross and overall and beam and summer draft and the TEUs, that gives you a good idea. The, the graph on the right, just over here on the right side of me, that's the one that kind of gives you the specifics. Hey, what's going on, Seven Stacks? Shell Bean, thanks for being in here. I appreciate you being here today. But it's all of these items that allowed for the dolly to actually become um, a, a, a factor in, in this. Now, I said something in a short and in my descriptor when I was talking about this stroke uh, where the, the puff of smoke came out. So as the ship was coming along, you've seen the big billow of smoke. And I said something incorrect because I wasn't quite sure of the structure. And I said that the, dual, the dolly was most likely a dual prop ship that allowed for two engines. And it's not. It's only one. So again, another alignment of that Swiss cheese model. A single propeller, a single uh, uh, engine. It has a two-stroke crosshead diesel engine but it's only got the single shaft. And her main engine is a nine cylinder BMW. I'm not gonna go over the other ones. Chief Stacker was here, he'd be all over this. He'd know exactly what was going on. The rate was 440 kilowatts of power at 500 or 55,000 horsepower. And the max speed is 22 knots. So it's a pretty big, it's a pretty big engine for this. But again, there was only one engine. So when you looked at that, and I'm not going to show that up. If you want to see that, there's a there's another video. You can go back and check on the video on that. But as they were trying to do the little kick maneuver, uh, you'll see this big puff of smoke. And what they were doing is they were refiring up that engine. And there were all, there's only the one engine, right? And so um, when you look at that particular item, you know that they only had one power source. Okay, again, another alignment in that Swiss cheese the single power source. Now they do have two, uh, two AC units or auxiliary units that feed that one, uh, but there's one primary auxiliary unit in this, again, only have a single redundancy, a single point of failure. Now we're gonna talk about something that I read that happened in 2016 and again last year, and I'm gonna get to that here in just a minute, but the next thing I wanna, wanna go over is I wanna talk about the bridge, okay? Now, because the bridge is something else that played a factor in this. Now, people are like, well, the ship hit the bridge. Yeah, but there were things with the bridge that happened that people need to be aware of as well, okay? No backup power source seems like it's a necessity. So they have auxiliary generators, but we're going to talk about that because that's an extremely important point, right? You should never have single redundancy. You should have redundancy. Never single points of failure. Again, when we're talking about that Swiss cheese model, that's another one of those things that just happens to align. And when you can see the very end target, you can see the very end path and you know you have a problem. Having those things in that Swiss cheese, the various barriers, the various events are the things that cause the problems. And that's how you get to that event. Okay. So one of the other factors is the bridge. Okay. So now we talked about Panama. Okay. So in order to understand why the bridge is important, is that in 2015, prior to the, so the, the Panama project kickoff 2016. Why is that date important? Because in 2015, they dredged the canal and they dredged the canal to ensure that they could allow for these new Panam Neo Panamax ships. So they were already planning for the larger ships to be coming into this port. Where coins go, 
<laughs> well, coins are still going to be talking about. We'll be talking about coins another time. Um, I'm talking ships today. Uh, you guys know my channel. I'm going to be talking about this. But based off of conversation that I've had in various chats and various videos, um, this is something I want to do. So if you're only here to watch the coins, there's not going to be much coin talk today. Um, we're going to be talking about this. Um, stick around. There's a lot you can learn about this, but come check it out. So they had already drudged the channel. So when you look at the video that I did and I talk, you'll see the wide pan. You'll actually see the channel lane. So they had actually dug that out. So they increased the depth of that channel to be 60 feet. Now, the minimum was 50 feet. And that was done to accommodate these new Panamax vessels. So they had already widened that channel. They had already deepened the channel and they were preparing for this. But when they did that, there was something that didn't happen. And we'll talk about that when I go to the next section of these things. But for those of you who aren't really understanding of what happened with this bridge or when the bridge was created, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a history about this. Copper All Coins, good to see you, bud. Thanks for coming in, I appreciate this. So they call it the Francis Scott Key Bridge. All right, so earlier I stated that I had an AU Hannity 50 cent piece. This is a silver piece. And I'm not going to do the first person because there's a delay between the wide screen and the narrow screen. But what I'm gonna do is moderators, if I have a moderator that's willing to do that, I want you to do me a favor and kind of track this. So if I can get one of my mods uh, to kind of help me out with this, that would be great. We can talk about that. Um, <laughs> no, I haven't solved it, Paula, um, but I've done a lot of research because there's a lot of different things that I want to look at. Now, there are a lot of events on board ship, and I have a lot of questions. And when I stop showing this and I get back to the other view, I'm going to be asking questions to chat because I have some questions that I want you guys to think about. This is Critical Thinking Challenge 101, and these are things you should be doing when you're looking at events like this. All right, I'm just listening on the phone right now. No problem, me, not a big deal. But the Francis, Ski, Francis Scott Key Bridge was named after Francis Scott Key. Okay, given, right? Understand that. But I want people to be entering into chat, and I'm gonna go back and look through chat and find out who got the correct answers, and I'll do a little will a little bit later on today for these to see who wins this. But can you tell me who Francis Scott Key was? Now, I would really love for you to know American history without having to go Google it. But if you have to go Google it, go Google it and throw something in chat. Let me know. I'll come back a little bit later on after this stream. I'll pull names and we'll do that. But if you happen to know who Francis Scott Key is, see, okay, Jackalope, not a big deal. Well, you know what I want you to do? I want you to go look it up. Seven stacks. See, I love the people who know this. Hopefully seven could do this and didn't have to do this. Papa York, same thing. Hopefully you guys know this. They want to rename the bridge. <laughs> uh, what do they want to call it? Uh, Impact Impact Bridge, the Star Spangled Dental. Yes. Okay, so that's right. So we got people doing this. Um, yes, he actually wrote the Star Spangled Banner. And for those of you who don't know that, we also know that as our national anthem. Our country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty of the I see. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside, let freedom ring. I love that particular poem. If you don't know the whole poem, I strongly suggest you go look at that. But he's the one that wrote that. So he is the namesake of the bridge. But in 1972, hey, um, I remember seeing somebody's birth year, hint, hint, HVAC. Um, just in case you didn't know that already. Hey, Jenny, sweetheart, good to see you. Um, that bridge was created in 1972. And it took about five years for it. And in March 1977, the project um, was done. And basically the reason that the bridge was done is because they had the Baltimore Harbor Tunnel, but there were some issues with the reliability and safety and things of that nature. So they wanted to increase not only traffic from the city side to the port side, but they also wanted to have something that's a little bit safer. Now, the cost of this was $110 million. Now, it's $110 million in 1970s, okay? So as you can see, you see the steel arch, you see the continuous trusses going through the bridge. 
And again, it was named after Francis Scott Key. Okay, we talked about that. But there were oversights in the relation to the expansion of the channel. And one of the issues that I have that is another gap, and this is what leads us to the next one, is the warning signs, okay? So we're gonna be talking about some of the potential things that happened that kind of contributed to this overall event. And I want you guys to be thinking about this when I'm talking about it, because as I started reading and looking at and studying what was going on and what happened to the bridge and what happened during the construct of the bridge and what happened when they grew the channel and why didn't they implement things called dolphins, not the <laughs> dolphins, but the things that actually protect the barriers. What, why didn't they install those, right? Why didn't they do the updates? And we'll talk about that here when we're talking about this. So I'm gonna kind of go through and talk about that expansion. So the first thing we look at is they increased the depth to 50 feet and they widened it. When they widened that, they took the air variability from let's say 40 feet on each side of that down to maybe half of that, if not even less. And when they did that, what they didn't do is they didn't add additional um, safety guardrails or protection, also known as dolphins. There's a number of different ways. Now you can see them in front, they're quite a distance, but they're not necessarily located to the support struts in the bridges themselves. And so the bridges themselves were open, they were exposed. And so that allowed for, for uh, contact with that strut. They should have put something there. Now, one of the major questions is why didn't they do that? Now, I'm not gonna ask that question right now. We're gonna have that discussion in chat a little bit later, but there's going to be, <clears throat> there, and again, I've seen other people talk about other bridges, yes, there are other things, there are other people that have talked about this. This is not the only bridge, this is not the only ship this year or within the last year to have had a ship run into it. And when you look at these things, we look at safety concerns and cautions. Now, ships lose power, not a problem. Drawbridges lose power, we understand that. And there are things that are in place. And I'm gonna talk about some of the, the items that also contributed to this. But again, we'll talk to that a little bit. The other one is I want to talk about the dolly, okay? Now, we're still gonna be talking about the early warning signs, but I wanna be talking about the, the dolly. So I'm gonna be showing this, but again, I'm gonna go back to this screen. And the reason is, is because I've got some notes on here that I want people to understand. Now, if you've read this at all, and you've looked in, into this structure, you'll find something that happened. The Antwerp birth collision happened in 2016. Now you probably have no idea what that is. What that is, is on 11 July of 2016, the dolly actually collided with a birth. <clears throat> now the, the birth is the actual dock. It's, so when, when you birth a ship, when you dock a ship, the birth is the area in which you, you pull up to. And so on in 2016, the front of the dolly impacted the birth. And that was in Belgium, the port of Antwerp. <clears throat> and it caused significant damage to her stern. Now, this was noted at various times throughout that there were structural uh, damage. Now, this was owned by Ocean Bulk Maritime. It's a Greek company, and it was chided by Maersk. You've probably seen that on the shipping vessels and the containers. They're a huge, huge company. And when they looked at some of these things, they have their own service history. And then you have um, the various ports. So if, so if, for instance, the port of Chile and the, the port of Antwerp and, and the port of Baltimore and Baltimore Harbor and port of uh, Corpus Christi down here in Texas. So you have the ports and you have the port authorities and you have the various uh, people who look and investigate things. They looked at the service history. And here's something that really got me. This was something that really kind of set me off because it was like, as a person who has served in the United States Navy, as a person in the, in the video that I did the other day, I talked about serving time in an engine room. Now, I was a weapons person. I, I, I dealt with um, sonar, I dealt with torpedoes, I dealt with anti-submarine warfare, I dealt with fire control. 
But as I was learning what they call ESWAS, it's your, it's your surface warfare to, to understand the entire makeup of the ship. I spent time spent watch in an engine room. I understood the control panels. I understood the engineering system, the steam systems, chill water systems, the crap sewage systems. And I look at some of these things and there was something that was I read in a service history that happened in June of 2023. And this is a major factor. This is a major issue. And this is something that it no longer showed up. But I want to introduce you to a term now. How many, how many Navy folks, if if I have a one, if for those folks that were in the Navy, if you were on and in the streams and you were in, I want you to put in a one. Okay, because number one, if you if were in the Navy, you've heard of this term before. It's called gun decking. Gun decking is when you have a job, it's a service job. You have this list of tasks. You have these things. I know me, gotcha. Um, you have this list of tasks that you have to do. You have service schedules. You have maintenance schedules. You have things you have to do. You have to make sure you do things. No problem, Ida. Good to see you. I didn't see you come in. I just saw somebody say hi to you. <clears throat> hey, Starling Cannabis. Good to see you. Um, you have this, this list of things that needs to be done. And they are things like making sure fire extinguishers are done. <clears throat> Excuse me. Goodness. You're looking at gauges, making sure that your gauges work. You're looking at sprinkling control systems. You're looking at chill water systems. You're looking to make sure that the service, the maintenance of the ship is done. And what happened in June of 2023 is that in the San Antonio, not Texas, but Chile, there was a port authority and they did an investigation. And the port state control inspected and found that there were deficiencies in the gauges and the thermometers of the ship's machinery. Now, the ship wasn't detained. They were allowed to, to work on it. They said the deficiency was corrected, um, but it had to do with the engineering and the machinery. Now, if anybody understands, um, now I don't know if people have seen this, but if you've watched the movie of the first nuclear submarine in Russia um, and you watch that, you look at the issues and they had where the, the thermonuclear uh, reactor that was there in the sub and the the technician they see it's in the engineers there and he's looking at it and he taps it and it, it doesn't do anything and then he taps it one more time and the gauge jumps right that's a significant problem if your gauges are not working they don't tell you the whole story about the health of the system and so when i saw this i was like oh man red flag right will robinson will robinson warning warning we have a problem. And the problem is, is if your gauges are not working, uh, you don't know where your system's at. You don't know what's going on. So they said they didn't detain the ship. That means they didn't let the, make the ship stay there until they could 100% validate and verify that these gauges were no longer systematic of issue. Now they said that they were okay and they gave them a clean bill of health. But the question is, is how did they fix the gauges? When they did the test, how did they do that? See, on the, on the occasion where the Chilean authorities identified that, they kind of let them go. Now, I read something in, in the items. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> York, warning, Real Robinson, warning. Time for Red October is not the same movie. Um, this is, um, I want to say it's like C2. Or something like that. It's um, the one where they they had the nuclear submarine and it sank, um, and uh, they ended up rescuing a lot of the sailors. There are a number of people that died, but um, the the ship actually sunk, and I think it's still down there, but I can't remember the name of it. I'll pull it up, but it's not the Hunt for Red October. Um, but anyway, when you're looking at that, you know they they K nineteen. Thank you, Redfield Medals. Appreciate it. That's that that K19 is the is the movie. Uh, but you'll see that that he taps that gauge and the Kursk. Thank you. Outstanding. Somebody else who knows ship's history. Um, and you'll see, you'll see that that gauge jumps. Well, that was a major factor for me. Okay, so now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to talk about the collision. So the ship had history of issues. 
And they're not necessarily major. And we have other ships that are out there that have had more issues, more engine trouble. They have worse service histories and they're out there. So all in all, the Dolly uh, service history. Okay. I have a real concern with the gauges history. Because again, if you don't know the history of your engine room, you don't know what's going on. Now, I will be honest, and I will say right now, I do not know what happened on board ship. I have been trying to identify things, but there are some questions that I have related to how things were put into place. And one of the major ones is, where were the tugs? Now, the pilots were on board, but you should have a trailing tug. Where was the tug? Um, they said they have multiple pilots. Now, a pilot is a person who navigates the ship through that channel. They're the ones the captain does not make the determination at the time. The pilot does. There were more than one pilot. They have propulsion, they have engineering, they have different things that they have to look at. So they had multiple pilots on this ship. I have a problem. I have a question about that. And we'll kind of get to that here in just a second. Now. When the ship notified, because they did send an alert and said, hey, there's a potential that we could have impact with the bridge. Um, they reached out. They found out that they had people working on the bridge. Um, they stopped traffic, right? Now, there were still crews on the bridge. They didn't get off before the impact was there. Probably looking to see what was going on, make assertions. Um, when they hit, of course, uh, people fell in. I don't know. Um, is a training tug? See, I don't know. And that's a question that I don't have the answer to. Normally, in certain segments, you would. Uh, again, this is one of the questions, Ashes, that I want to ask. It's really important. Um, David, I missed live streams on two phones. <laughs> Thank you, David. I appreciate it. And again, for those of you who are just tuning in or you've been watching, trying to figure out what they're talking about, I'm streaming in both landscape and vertical modes today. So I'm in two different ones. If you want to go to the other one, then you simply go to your phone, go to chat, click on that pin, and you can either go back and forth between either one of them. So you can see this in either one. Um, I did this to kind of make it a little more conducive for the people who were on their phones who wanted to have a little bit better view. You can see the information down below me. You can see uh, below me again, right? Clean minds, folks. Um, and I do have the chat below me, and I'm not sure if that happens on this one or not. But um, so if you're in one, but you want to be in the other, simply go to the chat, go to the pinned comment, and you can do this. If you haven't already done so, yeah, exactly. Blow me. Um, it's below me. Okay, I'll articulate a little better. I was talking about shafts, and I was talking about girth and width and length and dimensions, and now I say blow me. I'm just, I, it's, I, I'm going to get squirreled if I don't stop. Okay, so. If you like, if you like this format, and I want you to tell me if you like this format, if you like it, okay, fish sticks. Um, <laughs> Miss Goinker, you're going to get me in trouble. All right, um, but in, anyway, I wanted to really kind of make this more conducive to whatever platform you're on. So I really do appreciate you. Um, let me know which one. If you like this, great, thumbs up. Um, if you're new to the channel, please make sure so you're subscribing. I'm actually really, really because I love you too, Miss Goinker. Um, my squirrel sister from another mister. Uh, so much fun. Brings a lot of joy and humor uh, to the community. So love you, my friend. Really do appreciate you. Um, so let's go ahead and get back to this. Now, the ship did Mayday, right? And this is one of the things that, that was uh, we're told very on. They did say they were doing this. But here's something else. Now, Ashes asked the question, okay, uh, looking at the port, okay, Ordinarily, tugboats help to maneuver their ships out of their docks and doesn't require extended tugboat. Okay, great. So here's the important thing about that, Ashes. Okay, do you know what they were carrying? Who in chat knows what the dolly was carrying? Who knows what her storage was? The primary item, the primary item on board that ship. Who knows? Who knows? Who can put in chat? And who knows if you're watching and you're not you, you're not adding her into chat because you're not there, then do me a favor. Hazmat, yep, hazmat, hazardous material, ninety five thousand tons, ninety five thousand tons. Okay, why would you not have a trailing tug? 
Why would you not implement additional security measures? Why would you not engage in that extra little bit of caution, knowing that the primary item on board that ship, now there were other things on board the ship, there were other goods as well, but why would you not have a tailing tug? Why? Yeah, hazmat. Why would you not have a trailing tug? Again, it's another one of those Swiss cheese items, right? And I'll go back to the very beginning of this, and we're talking about Swiss cheese. Now, why am I showing the Swiss cheese? The Swiss cheese is a model that we utilize to identify gaps and barriers in the system that aligned to have that event. One of the major events, they didn't have the dolphins on the bridge. They didn't have any way to deter or to di redirect that ship away from the pylon. There should have been something that there that would allow that ship to gently push against and then come back off. They're weighted to, you know, 10,000 or 100,000 or 200,000 tons that would have stopped that ship. Now the ship would have stopped, it would have saved and protect the bridge. Number one, number two, service history of the dolly. The service history of the dolly was in question. I got to drink something real quick. The service history of the dolly is in question because I don't know. There's nothing in the documents that those gauges were actually solved. They were resolved. We don't know that there weren't engine problems when that ship took on the hazardous material. I would be really, really, really happy to see the engineer's safety inspection report to find out what that ship's classification was when it left. Had they actually done a full inspection, did they notice anything with the engineering systems? Did they notice anything with the auxiliary systems? Did they have any warning signs? If the captain or the engineering team were aware of it, did they state it? There's going to be a lot of stuff that comes out of the investigation of this, and I don't pretend to know. I don't know. I know that they had major system outages. I know that the main engine system failed. They kicked on auxiliary. That auxiliary allowed the engines to fire. That's why you see the puff of smoke as it went back through. They started to make that pit maneuver, try to swing themselves wide into that channel. So if they were going to be dead sticking it, they would get into that lane. So they were making that move. Why did they make that move? A lot of people said, well, they redirected the ship into the harbor. Now, there's some things about that you need to look at when you're looking at where this ship was and where the waterways are. The flow of the water in the harbor doesn't necessarily match the harbor lane, okay? So the lane that's in that, that channel, that water doesn't flow straight down that channel. Remember that the flow in the channel is slower than on the edges of the river. So you're going to have faster flow in the edges of the river. What they were trying to do is they were trying to position that more towards that center to allow them to kind of either push themselves through or deviate enough to get away. Now, I don't know why they were doing that pit maneuver. I don't know what was happening on board. I am not a pilot. I am not a captain. I am not in charge of this government or this uh, uh, this privately owned vehicle. That's not That's not something I do. I can't speak to that. But I do understand that if they were in that and that, that flow of the water automatically was starting to drift that ship into that direction, they would have tried to pull that ship, reverse that ship, right? Pull that away from the dock, try to get that forward momentum to stop and allow them at the same time to shift that ship over so that if they weren't able to do it, they would get through. Unfortunately, when they shift that, the direction, now they were putting it in reverse. I guarantee you they weren't throttling it, right? They were going to reverse that. What you can't see in the video that I showed was the water. And I talk about that in that other video. You can't see the water level. You can't see the churning of the water. You can't see the ripples on the roof. So you don't know exactly what's happening in the water. It's not a really cool picture, a clear picture. I haven't been able to see that very well. So I don't know what's happening. So as we come through and we look at uh, the harbor. So again, when we're looking at these two areas between the bridge, right? When we're looking at the bridge and you see that area between the bridge, they were trying to kick that ship out and around, trying to make sure that it didn't hit. 
Um, Intel, I've received this opportunity to hurt the USA last officer on board to guide them. It was sabotaged and then it was hacked. Well, okay, so here's the thing. This is another question that I want to have. Um, they want to say that the bridge was hacked. Okay, could that have happened? Maybe. I don't know the answer to that. And the reason that I don't know the answer to that is why would they do it here? I want you to think about this. Why would they do it in Baltimore? Now, Baltimore is a big harbor and it shuts everything down. It's going to close it down for a week or two while they clear out. They're going to have to redrudge it. They got the cranes there. They're going to be doing that. But why here? Why not in the port of Singapore? A much larger, a, a, some sort of devastation in Singapore would put an impact to much of the global commerce that happens. Not here. I don't see it as being a cyber attack. I see it as being somebody who gunned up, gun decked ship systems. I believe it as a failure that's there. It's the number one port. No, the New York Harbor, the New York port is much bigger than Baltimore. Now, it is a very large one. It's one of the largest ones, but it's not the biggest one. Um, the Jersey Port Authority, uh, the one between Jersey and, and New York is by far bigger than this one. Now, this is a very large one. Don't get me wrong. This is a very large one. <clears throat> and it would impact, but it only the, the, the impact is going to be minimal, right? Um, now, could they have done it because there, were, there was hazardous, hazardous waste and things of that nature? Could they have done? Maybe, maybe, right? But when you look, so how many people know, and I'm, is Paula still in here? She may have already bailed because we're not talking about coins. But here's the thing, Occam's razor, okay? Occam's razor. The simplest explanation usually is the correct one. Now, it's really easy to say that you have hacking. Okay, great. Um, what would be engaged in that? How would you have to do it? Number one, there's some questions that I have for you, okay? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to jump back out of this. I'm going to go ahead and bam, bring myself back over here so we can get back into the chat version of this. And I want to bring this up. Now, I'm going to pull up my chats. Give me just a second while I move these around. I want to make my chats a little bit larger because I'm going to be focusing more on the chat and less about the stream uh, health and all that stuff. So give me just a minute. I'm going to make these a little bit bigger here. Um, I've got some terrible eyes, but I want to be able to read these because the chat is where this is going to. Yeah, it lost power. I mean, yeah, it's quite clear that it lost power. I don't think it was done on purpose. So if you look at if you look at the information that's before you, right? They had a known history, known history with um, issues within the gauges, right? They, there was something we already knew that they had potential issues. Um, I they heard the pilot was Ukrainian and did it to protest the USA and um, conspiracy theories, right? They're easy, but here's the question. Okay, why this particular ship? There was more than one pilot, right? When they did the pit maneuver, did they did they move forward? No. When when you have a ship that fires off, okay, and you have to look, okay. You have to look at the items that were there. Could it be because of the materials that were there? Potentially, okay? Yeah, could it be there? Yes, but you have to look at the logistics and the things that were there. Conspiracy, it's really easy to just say, oh my God, you know why? You know why conspiracy is such a big thing right now? It sells. It gets views. It's BS. People want views. Conspiracy theories draw viewers it's really easy to say this fake coin cost me billions and you know what if i put that down in the title and that's my intro i'm gonna have tons and tons and tons and tons of people come listen to me spout crap why because people want to believe the mystery the chaos the craziness right and now okay too easy to dismiss. Okay, Papa York, that's true. But when you look at when you look at some issues, okay, I'll give you a great conspiracy theory. Iraq. Where were those map massive weapons? Where were those weapons of mass destruction? Right? 
the conspiracy theory about where they had him and how things were going on and where they were at and what the where were they? Where were they? They weren't there. Conspiracy theories most often are disproved, not proved. On occasion, a conspiracy theory will be proven. But if you look at the basic premise of what's going on right now, right now, you have some basic premises that were there. Number one, okay, JFK assassination, outstanding. That's a great one, right? Three people shot at the same time. That's a potential. It could, it could have happened, right? I just, they just wanted him dead. <laughs> Did he do it? Maybe, maybe not. Okay, but there were things that had. Okay, well, Sterling, let, let's talk history. If you really want to talk history, um, who got Hussein into power? We did. Okay. So again, when you're talking about conspiracy theories, you have to understand the history of the nation. You have to understand the history. One man's freedom fighters, another man's terrorists. We put people in places to cause some of those issues because we wanted to control a certain portion of a regime or we wanted a certain thing. Yes, we put him in power. Because of that, we initiated that. He got to, he got out of hand. We couldn't control him anymore. We wanted to take him out. Right. It's really easy for us to say conspiracy, but you have to understand the premise behind what's going on. I don't think that this ship running into the bridge, you gotta watch the time. I don't think the ship running into the bridge is a conspiracy. It's really easy to say Ukraine. It's really easy to say cyber attack. It's really easy to say those things. There were multiple pilots, not just one. Okay. It was very clear that there were more than one pilot. Not one pilot has control over the entire system. Pilots maintain different systems. Can the pilots fight each other? Yes, but if you have a discrepancy in that system, right, the captain has control as well, and they can take over control of that particular item. If a pilot was doing something, the other pilot would have told the captain they would have taken over control, and they would have done that. I don't agree with the conspiracy theory about it being somebody whose war-torn country is, is, is doing this because they don't like the fact that the U.S. isn't supporting them. I, I don't subscribe to that at all. Now, could it have been an, a, 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 an attack on the cyber structure? Maybe. But here's one thing that you have to know. The navigation system on that, is it an open system or is it closed? Meaning that the only connection between that navigation structure is between them and the, the parent company. Do you know the answer to that? Because if you don't know the answer to that, you can't state whether you know that it was attacked or not. If it is a closed system, it's very unlikely that that would happen because if it was a closed system and it was attacked, they would have shut all the ships down. They would. This would have been a worldwide event, not a, a single isolated issue. So if you're looking at these navigation systems, you have to ask that question. Is it a closed system? I don't know the answer to that. I wouldn't be able to answer that particular question for you because I don't have enough information. But what's the likelihood that somebody would have been able to hack a closed system? Very slim. So Occam's razor, right? The simplest answer is usually the correct one. Is that really simple or does that get really complicated and convoluted? You know what? A simple engine failure, a simple mechanical failure, a, a failure in a system that was known to have potential history and issues mechanically a year, less than a year prior, that makes more sense. It just makes sense. Now, Conspiracy theories, exactly 1462, right? Conspiracy theories are fun. They're fun to try to think about the different ways in which something could happen. They really are fun. This is why I love things like counterfeits, right? I love watching people like Jack Young and, and him look at some of the, the information in these coins and look at the mindset of the people who are counterfeiting and understand what they were thinking at breaking it down. Joe Cronin, another great person who really understands and breaks these things down and looks at them and looks at the nuance and what's there and how that happens. Hey, Ashes, thanks for coming in. Thank you so much for contributing to the, to the conversation. I really appreciate you, brother. I really, really do. Thank you so much for that. Conspiracy theories are why <laughs> this account. Um, yeah, but they're fun, right? They really are. There's a lot of cool things and again, conspiracy theories and understanding how things work and how things do, it's really easy to say it's this, right? It's really easy to say it's government, government, it's government. It's, it's, it's an easy fall guy, right? Now, do they make a lot of mistakes? Yes. 
But is it the only one? Is it the only way? To, no. And when you do this, one thing that we have to remember, folks, and I've only got about 20 minutes left before um, I do <clears throat> um, a redirect from this stream over to the Premier Train. Um, for those of you who are brand new to this stream, uh, let's do this. Has anybody subscribed in this stream? If so, if you're a one and you've never heard of the Premier Train, let us know. I'm going to have my mods throw in the Premier Train link. That's going to start at 10 o'clock central. Um, there's a lot of fun with this. UCI to learn. Thank you so much. I appreciate you doing this. But again, when we look at um, discussions and things of that nature, um, uh, there is an island right on the other side of the bridge. It's not like you can go to the... Well, so again, there's... <laughs> When you look at when you look at the conspiracy theory, you have to you, you have to ask why, and it's too easy to to go no it's it's not yeah it's not there it's there oh this could be happening this is whatever and that's fine it's not a big deal and they are fun they're fun to discuss but what I wanted to do is I wanted to do what's called critical thinking right really look at the incident and say what do we know what really do we know. Okay, so the pilot was Ukraine. So what? Well, who was the other pilot? Did they say who the secondary pilot was? Did they say what the nationality of the captain was? Did they say what the nationality of the crew was? Did they say the hundred of thousands of trips that this particular ship made and how many times this pilot who works in that harbor has done this job? Doesn't mean that because he's done it 100,000 times that he's not capable of it. No, we have pilots who fly airplanes who try to commit suicide by crashing the plane. Uh, Triple P actually had a discussion on this on one of his things where they had to take him over and, and pull him out of the way and, and subdue him because he wanted to, to do that. Now, does it happen? Yes, it happens. But there are redundancies and things like that in place. That's why an airline doesn't have just one pilot. They have two people, right? The same thing with pilots. There's two people on that. You have the captain. There's three people that are governing this bridge. So there's a lot of different redundancies and stuff in place. The redundancies didn't happen in the engine room. The redundancies didn't happen in the auxiliary room. The redundancies didn't happen in the protection of the bridge. So look at where the system failures were. The bridge, the ship, right? If the ship would have had the protections it needed, would this tragedy have happened? The ship failure, yes, it would have happened. Okay, it's, it's inevitable. It's not the only ship to leave a harbor that's lost power. It's quite common, actually. But carrying hazmat, there was no additional tug. What would, Exactly, Eric, we don't know what they want. They, we don't know all the information. So it's impossible for us to come to a final conclusion. All I wanted to do is to take a minute and walk through this with you guys, give you some critical thinking skills, give you some history about what happened, what allowed us to have this event, the expansion of the Panama Canal, the dredging of the harbor in 2017 making it bigger so ships like this could actually do this. Widening that channel, making it closer and more opportunistic for that bridge to get hit. The safety systems that weren't in place on the bridge, the single system redundancy failure on that ship that when that engine went down and that auxiliary went down, they were dead stick. They had no way to do it. They had redundancies in the pilot. They had redundancies in the standing of the captain. They had redundancies in that regard. I don't think it's that easy. I really don't. But when you look at where the potential failures were, it's quite clear to me that this was a systems failure in the engine room, failed component of an auxiliary system that could not maintain the power. When they put that up, they throttled that to that 55,000 horsepower to get that ship to reduce that, that that forward momentum to try to get that thing to stop, probably because they already had port authority on the line saying it's potential that we're going to hit this bridge. They were able to shut systems down. There were too many things that don't point to the conspiracy of the pilot. If their pilot was there and they weren't going to do it, they wouldn't have notified. There wouldn't have been a mayday. They wouldn't have issued those items. It just doesn't hold water for me, right? It's a glass that's held upside down without a lid on. It's not going to hold the water. It just doesn't make sense to me. But there are things that were put in place. And again, looking at that Swiss cheese model, all those things align. And I believe that 
is why it happened. Now, uh, for Fund 62 and competence, maybe, okay? I don't want to default to this because there's something that happens in process improvement. So I work in process improvement in my normal day job, and there's something called human factors. Human factors are the knock of information always. Exactly, Eric, that's exactly right. Human factors are the fact that systems fail people. Most of the time, people don't fail systems. I'll give you a great example. How many people in the chat, please put a one in chat if you have a diesel truck or a car that runs on diesel gasoline. If you do, put a one in chat, please. Put a one in chat if you have a vehicle that runs on diesel. Oh, uh, we don't have any diesel drivers? Come on, I know somebody works on a farm. Come on, somebody's gotta have a dually. <clears throat> Okay, you drive normal. That's fine. That's cool. David's in both streams. <laughs> I'm like, how did he pop up in both? Okay, so here's the thing. Farm dog. Okay, farm dog. When you go there, right, is it possible to put, now, where there's a will, there's a way. Where there's a blonde, there's a moment. Okay, but... Is it possible for the standard person to put diesel in a normal vehicle? No, I mean, you, you force it, make it happen. Is it possible to put diesel in a normal gasoline vehicle? No. Why? Because what they did is, well, you can force it, but you, I mean, you're, you have to do it. But it doesn't slide in like normal. And, well, not always. It's not. Because the size of the nozzle, well, if you use a funnel, yeah. if you use a funnel, yes, then you can. But the size of the nozzle on the diesel is larger. It doesn't fit inside that. Now, what you can do is you can put regular gasoline inside, but if they have the systems for diesel, there's a little latching mechanism on the top and it doesn't fit because it slides in too easy. It doesn't trigger that that sensor and it won't go in. So some of the new systems don't allow you to even put your other gas inside a diesel. Now, I did, I know I shouldn't have said that, I, I, but it, it takes skill, right? Where there's a will, there's a way. And where there's a blonde, there's a moment. And I don't, I'm not picking on blondes. It's just, it's, it's a statement. Okay, so, but there are systems in place, okay? <laughs> See, again, you have to think outside the box. Yes, there's a will, there's a way. But the system itself, when you go to fill in, the, the nozzle is bigger, okay? Same thing, when you're in a hospital and you try to hook up oxygen and you try to hook up a CO2 tank, they're sitting in together. They don't, they have different plugs. So, so you can't plug one into the wall because the plug for one doesn't fit. I can't take an O2 mask and stick it in a CO2 container tank. They don't fit. They don't plug in. I can't stick a CO2 or an O2 into a, an acetylene tank. They, the, the nozzles themselves are different. That's how this system prevents the human factor of the event occurring. What I can't say is if these systems on board this ship allowed for human error. So I don't know if the allowance for human error is there or if this was a system failure. The system itself could have failed. And most likely it's not somebody that failed the system it's the system that failed itself, okay? You gotta, <laughs> well, remember, when you're talking about the older vehicles, when you're talking about old pumps, yes, it could happen years ago. It's harder to do nowadays, especially with the new vehicles. Now, I'm not saying that it's absolutely impossible because where there's a will, there's a way, right? It, <laughs> there is no exactly Papa York. There is no 100% idiot proof. It happens. Um, but it's just, it's very, very, very difficult to do. These are system protections that are put into place that allow for these types of things to engage. Okay. So anyway, I hope that makes sense. Uh, again, conspiracy theory. If you are stuck on this conspiracy theory, do me a favor, do some research. I want you to stay away from certain people. Okay. Who are known 
and you can look at them and you can look up just general information and you can find out that these people love to spout bullcrap. Okay? Don't get your information from them. If they are known to be stirrers of the pot, don't get your information from them because they're looking for views. They're looking for subs. That's all they're looking for. They're not looking for truth. They don't care about the bottom line. They want to stir the pot. We have members of that in our community who love to stir the pot. They like conspiracy. They like this stuff. And you know what? It's okay to like it, but I want you to do me a favor. Prove it to me. Show me the information. Do the due diligence that I've done for you today and show me how you can prove that it's conspiracy. I want to see how you get, <laughs> don't get your news off YouTube. Hey, don't do that, Kevin. People won't listen to me anymore. <laughs> don't, don't listen to Kevin. He doesn't know what he's talking about. You know, forget the man behind the curtain. I'm just kidding. But again, if you want to do a conspiracy, you really want to do that, do me a favor. I will be happy to entertain it. I'll be happy to entertain the discussion. And if you have good, solid information, then let me know. I'm going to have a stream tomorrow. I'll have a panel open. Uh, if you want to come talk to me about that, do, go ahead. Come on up. We want to do that. I'll be more than happy to let you do that. But here's the thing. Come with facts. I don't want hypotheses. I don't want, well, generalities. I don't want it's happened before. I want to know facts. I want to know where you got your information. I want to know your sources. I can tell you where my sources were. If you want to see them, I'll give you the full list of them because I have a little resource document that I'll do that. I'll be more than happy to share this with you. I don't mind. But here's the thing. I want to provide you in my channel. Okay. I want to provide you the best realistic, truthful information that I can. If something comes out, if something comes out, and this ends up being a cyber attack and they have proof, they validate it and there's an engine system and there's something that happened and there was code that was put in and this was a malicious attack, I'll come back and I'll speak to it. But I don't believe it was. I think conspiracy theories will always be there. It'll be easy because news like that sells. So be careful, be leery. All right, folks. All right, so I'm gonna do me a favor. I'm gonna do me a favor, okay? I'm going to go get some more coffee and I'm going to get ready and head over to the premier train. If you are here for the first time, thank you so much for being here. If you are a channel member, thank you so much. If you're a subscriber, considering being a channel member, again, I don't ask you guys for super chats. I don't ask you guys for gift memberships. That's not something that I do. I'm here to provide you information. This is what I love to do. If I do something and you really like it, if I do something and you're really interested in it, or if you have an idea that you really want to see, whether it be coin or silver or gold or numismatic counterfeit, you want me to try to reach out and get certain people online, you let me know. My channel is for you. So if there's something that you want to know, you tell me, we'll do this and I will do my very best to do what I can. Okay. So most likely I'll have... <clears throat> My normal makeup, my normal Paula and them will probably be up here tomorrow. Hopefully Eric is here if he can be here tomorrow. Tomorrow is Easter. If you can be here, be here. If you can't, you can't. I fully understand. Not a big deal. But ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for all that you've done. I really appreciate it. 75 in pennies. Again, thank you so much for the super chat. I really do appreciate you. I really appreciate Kevin Rose. The $1.99 Super Chat, I really appreciate you. And again, I don't do this because I'm asking for money. I don't do this because I'm asking for memberships. It does help the channel, but I want to provide you good information. So all I need from you is to know that you guys like the content, okay? That's what I really want from you. All right, folks, Miss Coin Crew has thrown in the link. If I can have somebody throw it in the other side, so for the vertical view, if you can do that, please make sure that you're throwing that link over there. So if I can get David Carlisle or Eric to throw that in that vertical stream for that, please, please, please throw it end in there. Yeah, no worries. And again, if you can't make it, it's Easter, okay? Family comes first, folks. Family is the priority always. Family comes first. Um, but 
if you want to come out and hang out with me, um, if there's anybody who wants to, I know Paula might has family and grandkids and they might be doing Easter eggs and all that stuff. So she might be here, she might not be. Hey, is Stan here? Sorcerer Stan, what's going on, bud? Good to see you, I love that name. For those of you who weren't tracking, everybody here should know that Sorcerer Stan made a massive, massive impact along with um, uh, Invisible River Ranch to really, really blow up St. Jude. That was absolutely amazing of them. Sorcerer Stan, you're a stud. Invisible River Ranch, you're awesome. For everybody who contributed and helped with St. Jude, y'all are studs. This community rocks. Thank you so much for everything you do. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Frostbite. I bid you adieu. I will see you tomorrow. Take care. Be west. Be west. <laughs> be well. Be blessed.